commercial free Catholic charismatic channel. He's strengthening the faith of so many people. To promote the gift of church teaching, dedicated for the new evangelization. God's blessings on your work, may God bless and prosper you. Shalom World, God's own channel. My time, my talent, my money, my leisure, my sex life, everything. And we're, Jesus is looking at my chips, and I'm looking at my chips, and he says to me, what's your play? And I knew, and I wanted to hide my chips from him. So I took a few, and I threw them in and threw them a bone, you know, and I just, right? And he looked at me with that smile. He said, uh-uh. He said, Peter, I love you. But stop playing games. If you want to follow me, son, it's all in or nothing. It's all in. But Lord, if I do that, is my life going to be boring? Am I going to just, all the fun going to be taken out of life and all the excitement? Does it mean I can't hunt and can't fish and can't shoot hoops with my boy? No, 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 no. But what it means is, Lord, Everything I have, everything I own, everything I am, I entrust to you because I know you. You're the Lord. You've got a plan for me. My Father has put me on earth for a purpose. You've come to me, Lord, to help me lay hold of that purpose. And you've given me your spirit to give me the power to live in that purpose and to fulfill God's plan for me. So you are trustworthy, Lord, and I'm going to trust you with everything I got. Now lead my life. That sound exciting? That's called dying to yourself. <laughs> That's a bet many baptized men don't even want to think about. The majority of baptized Catholic men in America are living what Pope John Paul II called a kind of minimalistic Christianity. Hey, Father, what do I have to do to stay out of hell? Well, you got to go to church on Sunday, at least most Sundays. You got to go to confession once a year. And so, what we do is we buy fire insurance just in case there's a real fire at the end. You know what I'm saying? We don't shoot all out for heaven. We just say, well, you know what? I'm going to hedge my bets. I'm willing to just shoot for purgatory so that I can keep what I want for myself here and shape and define my own life the way I want to but I'm not going all in. It's too risky. But what happens, friends, if you shoot for heaven and you miss, what do you get? Purgatory. If you shoot for purgatory and you miss, where do you get? Christianity is about living all out for the Lord. It's about what? Thirsting, hunger, desire, passion. When men have skin in the game, when this matters to men, the church can't be stopped. Do you know that? Look at the statistics. I saw some stats the other day. If mom goes to church and dad doesn't, which happens a lot, somewhere around like 42% or 39% of the kids go to church. If dad goes to church, because dad wants to go, and mom doesn't go to church, Guess how many kids go to church, percentage? 70%. God gave you authority. God put a vocation on you. What matters to you will matter to your kids. Statistically across the country, Something like 22%, 23% of Catholics go to Mass on a weekly basis. Among the boomers, 
my generation, our generation, who kind of drank the Kool-Aid on a lot of the cultural revolution, we go at about an 18% clip, something like that. The, the, what is it, the generation, no, what's, what's between the boomers and the millennials, I forgot. Anyway, the millennials is 18 to 29 year olds, they're going to mass at about a 10% clip. 90% of them are not going to mass on a weekly basis. So we see the great challenge. I want to tell you, back home in my parish, we have a, actually have a couple of friends here from Christ the King. Anybody else here from Christ the King? Raise your hand. In Ann Arbor, Michigan, I belong to a parish, Christ the King, full of sinners, just like me. Weak people, normal people. Father Ed, our pastor, told me a couple of years ago, like somewhere around 93% of our parishioners go to church every Sunday. Two years ago, I think we had almost 22 seminarians just from our parish. I think, uh, maybe you know if I'm right, I think 12 priests ordained over the last 15 years had been members of our parish at one time or another. A bunch of religious sisters. Is it because we, the water we drink or something? No, why? I mean, because it's full of weak, broken people. There's a variety of reasons for it. But one reason I just want to mention today, brothers, is that there's a lot of men who have skin in the game. A lot of dads who love Jesus and have become his disciples, and they're living all out for him, and they wouldn't miss Mass on a Sunday. No way. Why? Because there's some rules on top of them that, that they have to do this? No, because their heart is in love with Christ. And they, as St. Paul says, now we live to please him. That's bottom line. And when a man moves from, and men really have a capacity to make sure we please ourselves quite a bit, when we move from that being our fundamental thing to pleasing the Lord first, that's the game-changing shift, and anything can happen. I mean, we live in a very secular town, Ann Arbor, Michigan, powerful town, kind of a great town, great place to be. But there's a big spiritual battle going on there. All these cultural things are really unfolding significantly in our area. One of the reasons is, one of the reasons why I think so many young men are willing to take a look at the priesthood is because of what it means to mom and dad, and they know it. And I would say especially to dad, because in so many places in the church, mom's carrying the faith. Mom's the one who's trying to get it all done. And when boys see their fathers honoring the church, living for the Lord, honoring the priesthood at that level, all of a sudden it becomes an option. I mean, my own kids, my boys, we have a friend, Mike Wagner, his kids and my kids are kind of at the same age, and we'd get together on Saturdays in the fall to watch Michigan or watch Notre Dame play football, and then we'd go out and throw the football around, and then we'd have a cookout or something at his place. And invariably, at some point around that meal that night, Mike would say, or I'd say, hey, what's God doing in your life? We just start having conversations about what God's doing in your life. And our kids just kind of grew up in an environment where their dads spoke in a way that they actually knew the Lord. And they had a relationship with God. And faith was just normal. It was just out there. It was just alive. Now, when I grew up in the little German community in southern Minnesota, filled with wonderful heroic people, I never had a conversation one time my entire life through 12th grade with an adult man who ever attempted to share his faith with me and to give me some sense of why he believes what he believes. Never happened. Does it mean they're bad people? No, not at all. Might be saints. But we're living at a time now, as John Paul II said, men, it's time for us to learn how to speak the name of Jesus to one another, to communicate our faith, to spread the good infection by our witness of life but also the reasoning for the way we're living our life is crucial. Let's say it again together. We want God. Do you mind, you mind, this is kind of a men's meeting. You guys mind standing up just for a second? Stand up. Stand up. And you know what? I want us to rock this place just for the fun of it. How about that? Ready? 
On three. One, two, three. We want God. One more time. We want God. It's not enough, you guys. We want God. Amen. We want God in this diocese, in this parish, and across our country. There is a war going on in our country, and the only thing that's going to stop it is men and women who are willing to go all in and be saints. Because you know what? It's going to be hard to be a Catholic in the next five to ten years. It's going to get... How many of you feel like you can feel the heat already turning up? Are you living in a different world than you did 15, 20 years ago? We can't escape it. It's coming. You know why? The Lord's permitting it. He's permitting it because he wants to purify the church, because he wants to wake up men, and he wants to make saints out of us. We're too flabby. We're too self-centered. We're too cozy right now, and he's coming to say, you haven't listened to me when I call you easily, but now what I'm going to let you do is I'm going to let the enemy test you. And then the enemy's going to bite his own tail. He's going to do the one thing he never should have done. He's going to persecute the church. He's going to persecute the church. Woohoo! Yeah! It used to be good for business, brothers. The church was the place to be, but not so much in the future. Because you're going to be called a hater. You're going to be called a bigot. You're going to be called what? An intolerant person. Are you ready to stand up for the truth? Because showtime is coming for every single one of us. And the church will go where her men will go. If you have the courage to be a disciple of Jesus, what did he say to you? If you want to follow me, you can sit down. No, I'm sorry. He said, if you want to follow me, people said, oh, I'll follow you. Miracles, yes. He raised people from the dead. Yeah, woo! I'll follow you. And he said, hold on. Hold on. If you want to follow me, you got some calculating to do. Because I'll promise you this. If you follow me, you're going to get what I got. He said it. The world will hate you because it hates me. It doesn't want my Father's commandments. It doesn't want to do my Father's will. You just try it and watch what happens. That friendly environment we've had here in the country is moving away. And it's going to cost us to stand up. And the Lord's going to prune the church through it. It's going to happen. Some people are going to say, whoa, I want people to like me. And right now they don't like Catholics, so I don't want to be a Catholic. And people are going to back away. And that's how the Lord prunes. That's how the Lord disciplines. Just know it when it's coming, because I know you've already seen it. It's already unfolding in our culture. It's all around us. What's the solution? Brothers, that discomfort that happens when, when you see that happening around us, and it's a little destabilizing, what we need to do is get on your face. Go after God. Go after God with all your heart. Hunger after Him. Thirst for Him. Tell Him, say, Lord, I'm scared. I'm afraid for my children and my grandchildren. And he'll give us courage. What is courage? The willingness to sustain a wound in defense of what's good and what's true. Are you willing to sustain a wound, my brother, for the battle that we're going for right now? John Paul II in 1976 said this. I don't know if you saw it in the Magnificat last week. We are now entering the final confrontation between the gospel and the anti-gospel, the church and the anti-church. He said, this conflict lies within the hands of divine providence. No one can escape it. Wow. That's not a movie, man. That's real. That's the real thing. What the world is waiting for and what the world needs is men alive in Jesus Christ. You have in you the antidote for the situation in the country. You really do. You really do. Because the king lives in you. He's made his home in you. The church 
has an infinite capacity for regeneration because her king is alive forever. He already won the battle. And what he needs is for you and me to believe it in our bones and to put him first, then watch out. He wants to make us saints. And if we're willing to say, yes, make me a saint, Lord, I'm going with you all the way, that's exactly what the world most needs now, to heal it and to free it. The world needs to see Jesus Christ alive in you. The reason you get up in the morning, the reason you're living, the reason you can have joy, you can have hope, the reason you have confidence for your own children and your grandchildren, that God can solve the problems that you're facing in your own life. You know that when you become his disciple, when you come and live under his lordship and you give him everything in your life and follow him, you know he can lead you through it and make something beautiful out of your life. I know it in my own family. I'll end here. I grew up in a little German community in Minnesota. Anybody know where New Ulm is? Everybody heard of New Ulm, Minnesota? Wow, great. Where's my wife, the big hotshot from Chicago? She always laughs about little New Ulm, Minnesota, but she's coming later. I always tease her. Lots of people know about New Ulm. Wherever I go in the world, I don't know why. Maybe it's the beer and the polka music. I think that's it. I really think that must be it, you know. My dad was a tank commander in Patton's Third Army in the Battle of the Bulge. He could speak fluent German. He uh, helped liberate Mauthausen concentration camp, was one of the first there. He could speak German, so they had him there helping with the communication. My dad was there for almost four years, and he saw everything. He saw one of his best buddies he was at, in Georgia with at basic, at basic training get his head blown off right next to my dad. My dad got out of the war. My dad was a very good man. He got out of the war, came back to the little town, New Alm, he was born in, and he started a business. He did a lot for his town, but my dad had a problem. He had a drinking problem. And it was with us all the way, right after the war. I wasn't born yet. But the time I came along, we had seven kids. Lived a block from the elementary school, the Catholic school, Catholic high school, the cathedral. As I said, my father was a good man. On the outside, it looked like my family had everything going. You know, star athletes, homecoming queens and kings, and all but me were good students. I was the only one who was a little bit, I, I still don't know what happened to me between 12 and 15, but I was off the rails. We tried to get my help from my dad many times. The judge sent him once for treatment. Nothing ever helped. My older siblings, I was the second youngest of seven, my older siblings, as they were leaving the house, many of them just started leaving the church. They just stopped going to church, my brothers and others. I was the last boy home, and the boys, what we'd do when my dad would drink, he'd come home at night. When he drank, he was not an easy guy to be around. He physically would never hurt anybody, but he had all that pain and anger within him that his generation many times didn't know how to share, and it just came out of him. One time, my sister, Kathy, the oldest in our family, called home and said, I've got to come home this weekend. I'm bringing the family down. She lived in North Branch, Minnesota. Anybody know where North Branch is? And she said, I'm gonna, I want to bring the family home because i got to tell you guys something. And I knew something was happening in her life, but we never talked about it. She came home that weekend. Some of us were there sitting at the kitchen table on a Saturday night. My dad was out drinking. She said, you guys, in our parish, we have a little prayer group, a little Bible study that meets on Wednesday nights. She said, I've been going for the last 18 months or whatever it was. And she said, at the end of each study, we pray for all of our needs. And for the last six months, we've been praying for dad. And she goes, I want to tell you what happened on Wednesday. Now, nobody ever talked this way in our, we never even talked about God. We prayed the rosary, but we never had these kind of conversations together as a family. She's sitting at the table. Her eyes are like flaming fire. She's so passionate. She goes, after I was going, after we prayed, I went to the car and I was, got to my car and one of the local farmers who's in the program came up to me and said, Kathy, you know what? We were praying for your dad. I felt in my heart, God wants me to come and tell you that God's going to hear your prayer. But what he really wants is your family to come back to him and to repent. And she's going, wow. And she got in the car, pulled the door, shut another guy, two farmers, two men. Second guy opened the door and said the same thing to her. See, so here she is, sitting at my kitchen table in New Orleans, Minnesota, one block from the cathedral and saying, you guys, God's trying to talk to us. I said, what? I mean, I thought, I mean, my sister is of sound mind and body. 
But I was kind of thinking, sure, God's talking. Sure, you bet he is. Who heard God? What's he smoking? She goes, no, I believe that if we listen, she goes, the problem is, you guys, we're Catholic, but we don't live like it. We really don't live with all our hearts for God. Our family's sick. I don't care how successful we are. We've got dysfunction and brokenness here, and we're losing our faith. Mom and dad have all these grandchildren. What's going to happen with them? She's going on and on. And she said, we need to get serious about God. She's passionate. And she said, none of us, especially the guys, and she looks right at me. She goes, some of us aren't thinking about God at all, basically. She's looking right at me. I'm going, okay, she's got my number. I went to bed that night. And I'm laying in my bed, and my sister I love, sound mind and body, she's not a whack or a kook. But man, did she have passion. I never saw that before, ever. That kind of passion from a Catholic that I knew personally. And I'm laying in bed, got out of bed, got on my knees. First time I prayed on my knees, alone in my room since I was a little guy. I said, God, I don't know if this is you. I don't know if you're really trying to talk to us. But the one thing I know is, please heal dad. Please heal dad. My dad's brother died of an overdose of alcohol and pills. I just knelt there and I wept. I went to bed, fell asleep. Two weeks later, Monday night, sitting at home doing homework, which is a kind of miracle in and of itself. And I'm sitting there about a quarter to 11 at night, my dad comes in the house. He'd been drinking. My mom went to bed already. And he came and sat next to me. And I never looked at him. I didn't want to engage him. Because if he did, a lot of stuff would come out of him. So I ignored him. And he sat next to me, and I can smell the booze right now, you guys. I can smell it. Because when Dad would get drunk, he'd get smashed. And he sat there, dead quiet, and I could hear him breathing in and out. He was a tank commander. My dad was a leader. My dad was a tough cookie on a lot of levels. And he suddenly said, Peter. And I didn't pick my head up. And he said, son, I didn't pick my head up. He reached out and grabbed my arm and those strong hands as he squeezed my arm and I felt his hand shaking like this. And he said, son, look at me. And I looked up at him and he was crying. First time in my life I ever saw a tear flowing from my dad's eyes. And he said, son, I'm a sick man. Please help me. My dad never asked help from anybody, ever. And here I'm sitting, 16 or 17 years old, and I said, Dad, God can help us. God's going to help us. And I'm having like an out-of-the-body experience looking at myself like, what are you talking about? I mean, what do you know? He got up. He walked in to pick up the phone in his home office called Doc Ringhofer about quarter to 12 at night. He said, Doc, this is Joe Herbeck. I'm a sick SOB, and I need your help. Please help me. He went into treatment the very next day, inpatient, about the fourth time he went, but this time it stuck. Our family, some of us went with him at different times during those four weeks. At the end of those four weeks, he stood up and said, my name is Joe Herbeck. I'm an alcoholic. I cannot live without Jesus Christ at the center of my life. That was 1977. My dad died in 97, 20 years of sobriety, the best years of his life, 16 years as a city councilman, did tremendous things for the city. My mom and dad have seven kids. All of us came back to the church, all seven kids. My mom and dad have 73 children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. And just about all of them today are living in faith, living for the Lord. My family was right there, you guys. We were checking out. We were leaving. We were walking with the world. And you know what brought us back? I think my mama's prayers. My mama prayed that rosary every single day. And she lived through hell, friends, at times. And she had confidence in God. And she prayed, she read scripture, and did the rosary every day. Every day. And she was 30 years living with dad, or more, in that condition. My dad was alcoholic, his brother was alcoholic, my grandpa was alcoholic, and it stopped at our generation. Isn't that something? That's what happens when a family says we're broken, we're sick, 
we have struggles, we're not going to hide our weakness. What we're going to do is we're going to go to the king because we know he loves us. And we're going to get on our knees and we're going to say, Lord, this is who I am. I want to live for you. Come and be Lord of my life. Come and be Lord of my home. I want to be the father that I keep failing in my weakness. He doesn't condemn you. He calls you. And he wants to say, if you let me in, I will bring healing to your life. I'll bring healing to your family. And I will make something beautiful out of your life but you got to go all in. Don't play games with me, all right? He's saying, don't play games with me. Give me your whole heart and seek me first and let my kingdom reign in you and watch what I do. That's what a father is, a forgiven sinner who's broken, who doesn't condemn himself, but he wakes up in the morning and knows the king is with me. He's given me a mission, and he's in my home right now. He's giving me the Holy Spirit to guide me and to guide my wife together to bring healing to us and to have his kingdom reign in our home. And if you want that, it's going to come. If you play games and you've got other things first, the devil's going to have his way with your kids and your family. That's what's going to happen. But if you stand vigil with the king and you have passion, He will lead you and your kids and your offspring to the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. God is good, isn't he? It's good to be a man right now, isn't it? It's a great time to be a man of God. Let's end with a prayer. Let's end with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the call to discipleship. Jesus, we hear you today. Brothers, I want to ask if there's anybody here, not because I want to make a show, but this, I wasn't even thinking of doing this in my heart, if today you felt in your own heart the Lord reaching out to you to say, it's time to go deeper, son. I love you. I want you to come with me now. I want you to get in the fight. I want you to, we'll just keep our eyes closed. But I just want you to stand up. You feel like that's been happening in your heart. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day, for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for making us sons and fathers. We confess our brokenness, our weakness, our fear. But we hear your voice and we say yes to you today. Lord Jesus, come and be Lord of our lives, our hearts and our minds, our homes, our children. Forgive us for any compromise. Come and reign in our home. We lift up our kids, our grandkids, our entire families, our spouses. Bring healing, bring freedom. Let your will be done. Lord, we want to come into the fight with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength in your power, in the power of your Holy Spirit. Mother Mary, we entrust ourselves to your prayer. Pope John Paul II, you have called us to battle. Pray for us. Let's end. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Great being with you, brothers. God bless you. Have a great day.